This is my favorite Pokemon theme ever, by the way. I mean, this is a remix of it, but uh, yeah, I love it to death. And I have since I was six years old. Anyway, uh, today we are going over a GSC team that I love and that has had huge impact on the metagame. Uh, to the point where it really... The reason I'm choosing to showcase it isn't just that it's a great team, uh, but it's a great team, it's a unique team, and it challenged some of the most sacred fundamentals of the tier, uh, which in GSC is a big deal because Snorlax is so overpowering that the rules for dealing with it are kind of hewn into rock, you know? It's like, you cannot mess with this. It's like dealing with Kyogre in Gen 4 Ubers, for example. It's like, the number one rule is if you do not watch out and follow these whatever, then Kyogre will just mess you up. And Snorlax is even more ruthless because it's unkillable. At least Kyogre, you know, has weaknesses. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I went to look for this team in the sample thread because I figured it would be there. I remembered it being there, and I was uh, looking through the sample teams, and for those who don't know, the sample teams are chosen specifically because they are representative of what the metagame is at the highest level. Uh, these teams and team styles are used by the best players in the biggest tournaments, all that jazz, 1979, directed by Bob Fosse. But today, we are going over Thief, 1981, directed by Michael Mann. Uh, and as I was looking for this film slash team, I saw a different kind. I was like, huh, okay, Thief, Eggy, Espeon, Offense, that's cool and all, but where's the team I'm looking for? Did they take it out, uh, take it off, take it out? And then I scrolled down to the outdated sample team section, I was like, yep, there it is, removed, uh, July 2023. That's a shame. I personally don't think it's outdated. Uh, th it's not really relevant to the point of this video. But, I respect the opinion of the people maintaining these teams, of course. I just uh, fundamentally have a difference in philosophy on what constitutes outdated. Like, I, you could bring this team to a tournament today and be successful. Uh, and you would not be at a disadvantage for doing so. I don't think it... You know, the... I'll save this uh, whole thing for a video which deserves it more, but basically, this, the shifts in GS... In, old generations in general are not so seismic that they completely invalidate a team that existed, you know, a few years ago. You know, I, I see it thrown around in Advance and DPP all the time, and I'm like, God, like, the, the Pokemon are generally still the same, you know, they're fundamentally solid. And to further prove this point, uh, every once in a while, one of these quote-unquote outdated teams will get brought to a tournament. It's like, oh, wow, what a great call. Wow, yeah, that team's really good still. And everyone won 80s, and I get frustrated. But <laughs> that's not really what it's about. So I say that, all that to say this, that if you want to use this team in your next GSC outing, go for it. Now, you might recognize this team because I used to ladder with it a lot in my videos uh, because it is extremely fast-paced and, you know, fun to use, uh, so you can get a lot of ladder games with it, uh, since you're not going to be locked into stall fests all the time. And it forces you to really be on your toes, emphasizes skill, which, you know, is a, the part of the Pokemon, uh, the part of this lovely game that I look for. And, uh, another, speaking of seismic shifts, that's another reason why I wanted to showcase this team, like, I wouldn't call this ship, you know, yeah, but let's not get bogged down in the terminology. Like, the reason why this team is so impactful and why I'm making this video is because it really did cause a significant difference in how GSC offense was viewed and how it was played and what could be done with it. Uh, and, you know, at first, I remember when uh, Case first told me about it, it was just, oh yeah, it's, it's this cool idea I had, I'm messing around with it. And then I was like, oh, that's, that is kind of cool. And then, you know, using it seriously, it's like, wait, this is, this is the real deal. This is not just like a gimmick team. Like, this is not experimental or something like that. No, this is legitimate. Uh, so, I wanted to show it because, uh, in addition to challenging the old fundamental standards, 
uh, it did so and then proved that GSC could be really, really offensive. Because when you think GSC offense, you think, you know, explosion. And this team does have two explosions, of course. But you think generally stuff exploding for Zapdos or like a Vaporeon or Machamp late game, generally. You know, maybe you throw in a Pursuit or something. But generally it's stuff like that, right? And even that generally has a more measured pace compared to more modern generations, you know, with EVs and things like that. Or non-maxed out EVs across the board, I should say. Anyway, uh, and to get truly hyper-offensive by later generation standards, then the only real option you have for GSC is, like, Baton Pass. But Baton Pass is stupid because you can't really use it too skillfully. I mean, GSC Baton Pass takes more thought than others, for sure. But by and large, Baton Pass is still the same stupid strategy that it is in the other generations. And I say stupid not in that I think it's, you know, cheap or whatever, but in that I think it is not really something you use skillfully. It's pretty much hoping that the opponent does not have the tools to deal with it. You know, which is why it generally doesn't get used, because why do that when you can just trust in your own play? Well, I won't delve into player psychology that leads cheese to be used. I think I already made a video about that. The rise of cheese, cultural change, stuff like that. Um, and in a even more related way, I will not delve into the rise of Jinx. I might have mentioned this, te this team in uh, my Rise of Jinx and GSCOU video, if you want to check that one out. But yeah. Uh, this team operates at such a blazing pace that it is the closest that GSC truly gets to approximating hyper offense. Yes, and the game can slow down because yes, you do have a resting, sleep talking Snorlax. But you know, compare this to other GSC offenses, you know, more traditional GSC offenses where their Zapdos is rest talking as well because yeah, Zapdos counters everything. Uh, but here, it's it doesn't even have leftovers. Now that part is flexible and of course this team has a lot of flexibility in its choices I was experimenting with a lot of things but uh, this team is just hitting so fast and so hard right out of the gate in a way that was not really seen before and is difficult to replicate otherwise which is what makes this team stand out now this is not the only way that you can do this but this team like you see that uh, that other sample team the thief eggy espion thing that is directly, you know, inspired by this. So, and we see a lot of other teams now that operate in this style. Like, people were so inspired by this team that they were experimenting with stuff like this with Alakazam. And uh, in a second, we'll get to just all the different kinds of traditional wisdom or rules that this team was breaking. But, uh, yeah, I wanted to focus on that because uh, the... Otherwise, otherwise, the offensive options you're going to have, you know, the even if you're booming nonstop, then that's way more high risk, first of all, because, you know, you boom four or five times against a good player and you do it too quickly and they're just going to walk all over you. It's, it doesn't work like that. So it's more about getting into a good position to where you can get that boom off and then run them over. But that's why even offense on offense games can take, you know, 50, 60 turns. Now, measuring it by turn count is kind of silly. Uh, like, there are plenty of Oris and uh, Sun and Moon games that are between offensive teams, bulky offensive teams, but offensive teams, but they'll go to, you know, from like 40 up to like 80, 90 turns, and, and they're great. So, uh, yeah, even GSC offense with, you know, plenty of booms, they're not using those booms haphazardly, because otherwise that kind of defeats the point. You have to... Uh, force them into a position where your boom is not predictable and they cannot avoid it as easily. You know, that's that's the nuance of it. But this, since it does not rely on boom to make its progress necessarily, I mean, yes, Cloister Explosion is one of the biggest threats in the game because water resists are, or sorry, normal resists are uh, rock, steel, ghost. Rocks, uh, obviously don't want to take stab serve. Steels, not really. Steelix, Fory, Skarm, no. And the ghosts, I mean, Missy and Gengar do okay, but they don't love switching into it. But, yeah, so, and it, uh, Cloyster has a great attack stat, so its neutral boom is KOing a lot of stuff. And then Gengar is obviously a great boom user, not because of its attack stat, that can be kind of underwhelming, but because of its otherwise amazing offensive toolkit. But the thing is that this team 
is packing so many different threats from so many different directions, which is the mark of a good GSC team. You know, you don't just put all your eggs in one basket, all your executors, am I right? Uh, so you have lots of different options here. Now, in this team, you know, with the Triple Thief, this was not the first team to, uh, to really abuse Thief, of course, you know, or even multiple Thief users. But that kind of brings us to the rules that this team was breaking. Uh, or challenging, whatever. Uh, so, the problem with stacking multiple other Thief users is, let's consider our Thief, thief users, right? So, uh, even before Jinx was popular, this was being used because Nidoking is great, Gengar is great, and then your other offensive Thief user is going to be Exeggutor. You know, I, I personally had a team that was actually quite similar to this, I remember. Uh, it was, I think, I think my Zapdos is even HP Water... But I think it, uh, or it was offensive whirlwind HP water, but with T wave. No, it wasn't whirlwind. Sorry, it was uh, T. It was thunder drill peck HP water thunder wave, if I remember correctly. It was a set uh, that Dexa told me about. But yeah, and so it was that and uh, Thief Gar, Thief Nido, Cloister. So it was basically this set of six Pokemon, but with uh, Eggy over Jinx, and it was pretty good. But it did not have meta game uh, now. Actually, I'm sorry to toot my own horn here, but that was kind of a precursor. But before you think it sounds too impressive, remember that it did not really have any impact on the metagame. And now, in retrospect, I was like, hey, that team was actually pretty good. But I don't think anyone else saw it and was like, yeah, you know, we should be using more stuff like that. Uh, so I did not take it far enough for that. Whereas Case's team was, you know, taken like, oh, no, this is a real serious thing. You know, and when I built that team, I was still... Uh, learning GSC, so I didn't have all the rules down pat as when I, you know, forced myself to... Uh, because I, I wasn't, you know, playing it too seriously at that point either. It wasn't until I had to play it really seriously that I really learned the rules. So what are these rules? Well, okay, so you're stacking Thief users, right? So Jinx, Nidoking, Gengar, Exeggutor, those are your options on offensive teams. Okay, so you want to stack as many of them as possible. Cool. Well, you need your Snorlax, and you need your Spikes, because the whole point of Thief is that it goes beautifully with Spikes, right? It's, you know, the Gen 2 equivalent of knockoff. Uh, you want to... And this is how you force... You know, when you don't have leftovers, then the opposing walls, bulky as they are, suddenly they're a lot less imposing. You know, because, oh, they take 12.5 on the switch, and then your damage. Oh, but, and they're not healing back 6.25 on that turn, or the turn after when you switch out. You know, so, as opposed to uh, lefties basically out healing spikes after two turns, then now that spike is, you know, they have to manually heal from every little bit of damage. It's a world of difference. So, okay, so you've got your three Thief users, and your Cloyster, and your Snorlax, and then your Zapdos. Okay, well, here's the problem, Chief. Uh, the conventional rule, and again, most GSC teams still abide by this, and we will look at the sample teams here if you uh, need a visual. And if you're just listening, don't worry. Uh, you are not going to miss anything. So these uh, GSC standard teams, they all have a phaser... And they did before this team, and still most of them do today. They have a phaser who also resists normal. Why? Okay, well, let's look at the Snorlax problem. The Snorlax problem is, is that Snorlax is unkillable and destroys everything else, right? With curse and rest. So, how do you deal with it? You beat it down, usually with Zapdos Thunder. You force it to rest, and then you phase it out, right? Uh, and then it is less threatening because it's forced to sleep, it has to come back in, it has to spend some turns waking up, taking damage from spikes and hits and whatnot. So generally, you know, even offensive teams, as aggressive as they are, not every team can run the one attack that truly scares uh, Snorlax without, you know, sacrificing yourself in uh, Explosion. And that is Machamp Cross Chop. Not every team runs that, first of all. Second of all, Machamp is a terrible Snorlax switch because it does not resist normal and does not have a particularly impressive defense stat, so it takes about a billion from all its... Uh, I'm exaggerating, obviously. But you don't want it switching into those normal moves unless you absolutely have to. So, uh, by... And otherwise, you are not, you know, really defending against it because Snorlax is broken offensively and defensively. So you just gotta beat it down, uh, whether it's with your own Snorlax or Zapdos usually is the most consistent choices. But things like Exeggutor and Nidoking can also do the job, other popular offensive choices. But... Uh, Cloyster obviously switches in, and Toxics, and, you know, Weathers hits pretty decently. Toxic Surf, uh, Force the Rest. But once you force the rest, okay, well, what are you going to do? Because you're not going to beat the Snorlax through sheer force after it curses and rests, right? So that's where you have the Phaser to come in. 
You know, you force the red, because otherwise it will just sit on you and boost and beat you, right? So you need the phaser. Okay, well, why does the phaser have to be normal resistant? You know, what happens if, uh, why can't I just chuck Whirlwind on Zapdos and, you know, be done with it? Uh, well, because what happens when that cursed Snorlax also has Sleep Talk and it boosts up and then you go to your non-normal resistant phaser, your Zapdos or your Roar Nidoking or Vaporeon, great sets by the way, or, you know, even a bulkier team, say it has a, like a, a Suicune or something. And what happens when that Snorlax sleep talks its boosted normal move and absolutely destroys your Zapdos or Nidoking or whatever it is? Uh, yeah, well, in that case, you are absolute toast. Yeah, so <laughs> that is why teams need normal resistant phasers. And I mean, on defensive teams, they're easy to come by. Uh, because, of course, you want Skarmory uh, to handle Snorlax in general, but more offensive teams, then uh, I want to run all these offensive pokes, but again, you have to, you generally have to run that normal resistant phaser, because otherwise, the scenario I just outlined will happen. So that's why you see these standard styles of teams. T-Tar is the phaser. I mean, your options are Tyranitar, Golem, Steelix, and Rhydon. Unless I'm forgetting something, but I don't think I am. Because you're not using Skarmory on offense. So, those are your options. Um, unless, I, I guess, you... No, you, you wouldn't count Parish Song, Gengar, or, uh, or Mischievous. Because those would... Uh, Parish Song only works for uh, eight times. So, and is... Yeah, very abusable. Anyway. So, Yeah. And the thing is that you don't really hit Snorlax at fast enough a pace to not have this phaser, right? So, here's what Case's team does that compensates for this. Because you will notice it does not have a normal resistant phaser. Uh, so it does not have that T-Tar, Rhydon, Steelix, or Golem. Because as great as those Pokemon are, it does feel limiting to have to use them, right? So, and I mean, look, most, look, this is a... An early generation, not a ton of viable Pokemon. A lot of Pokemon are gonna look, or a lot of teams are gonna look familiar or uh, similar. Sorry, so that's fine, okay. But sometimes you really want to push it a little bit, and that is what this team does. Uh, so this team, number one, it does operate at fast enough a pace to where you don't need to, to where you can be more flexible around the Snorlax, right? And that is because of the Triple Thief. And the triple thief, and, and the first thief is coming from Jinx, which is much, much faster and uh, harder hitting than Executor. Right? So, I mean, it doesn't have boom, obviously, but. Yeah. So, the triple thief here is number one. Number two, if the, if the opponent has a mono Snorlax, a sleep talking Snorlax, you wall it with Gengar. You have that, right? And if they have a uh, curse Snorlax or, you know, an, an other Snorlax with. Uh, a move to hit Gengar, that's when you force it to rest and then you can phase it with Zapdos because it will not sleep talk, right? So, uh, Mono Lax, you can cover it with Gar, you can wall it, you have to be careful about Pursuit, obviously, but that comes with the territory anyway of using Gengar. And if it's not, then you phase it with Zapdos just fine, right? Also, you have Double Edge Sleep Talk or sorry, you have Sleep Talk Curse Lax. And Sleep Talk Curse Lax is kind of the apex predator among, cur uh, among Snorlax sets. Because if you need a Snorlax to switch in and beat all other Snorlax, this is the Lax to do it. You know, it's uh, the most reliable. And it also does this, uh, it also runs this set because, yes, it does not have Pursuit support, so you are going to be annoyed by opposing Go sometimes. Okay, sure. But... Uh, it is a price worth paying because this Snorlax is not only going to help you check other Snorlax, so you are not just reliant on the phasing Zapdos slash, uh, or phasing Zapdos plus Gengar combination alongside Thief Pressure, but you also need it to handle opposing Zapdos because your Thunder Resist or your Thunder Immunity is Nidoking, great, but Nidoking is not a Zapdos answer. If anything, Zapdos switches into Nidoking because Zapdos is broken, but yeah, so Snorlax, you need this Snorlax. It, it's kind of like the safe choice, as Borat would always say. Uh, it's If you need Snorlax to just kind of wall everything, you know, including opposing Snorlax, then this is the one to do it. So, between the triple thief pressure 
and the uh, the Whirlwind Zapdos plus Gengar combination, and the Sleep Talk Curselax, you have the Snorlax issue. You have the uh, issue of not running a normal resistant phaser circumvented, right? So that's really, really important. Uh, also, speaking of screaming fast offense, uh, y the Zapdos is so aggressive here since you recognize, yeah, lefties are great, and you know, you could run this team with lefty Zapdos, of course you could, but you're going so all in on this hyper offense team, the Zapdos doesn't even have leftovers, it has Magnet. Now, keep in mind, Magnet in gens 2 and 3, for that matter, uh, alongside all the other boosting items like charcoal. Uh, it only boosts 10%. You know, if it boosted 20%, it'd be used a lot more. But, since you are fighting for every single percentage, then it is important. So you have to go all in. And it even has a Thunder and Thunderbolt for every situation, because, like... I mean, yes, you could slot in T-Wave or Drill Peck or something there, but you're just going all in. So, you, you're you running Magnet, and th this Zapdos set was not used before this team at all. So... And now the Zapdos set, you know, with lefties or without, is actually a regular... I mean, okay, Whirlwind Zapdos was used before. That, you know, it's... I'm not saying it was never used. But, you know, this all-out Zapdos, Whirlwind, you know, uh, with two electric moves going this aggressively, that is new. Like, yes, Zapdos had a lot of room for experimentation. You could run Whirlwind, Reflect, stuff, Light Screen, great set. But generally, it was, you know, still going to be lefties, and, you know, certainly not on teams as fast-paced as this, because they didn't exist. So, uh, yeah, this the Zapdos set also does so much here in terms of... It, first of all, it keeps Snorlax at bay better because even just switching into a safe T-Bolt, which you know will hit, will hit it a lot harder. And the Thunders, I mean, Magnet Zapdos Thunder, you know, with spikes down, Snorlax hates switching into that. It's not going to be threatening you nearly as much as it's going to be, you know, trying to stay alive itself. And you're not just flailing away with electric moves. You have Whirlwind. And Whirlwind... Zapdos is one of the scariest offensive threats because you're not just using it defensively for Snorlax purposes, you are using it aggressively because it opens up the game, it opens up walls. Because let's say that the opponent has a Raikou, right? And normally Raikou will wall Zapdos forever, and yeah, you can double switch, whatever, but with, uh, you can, th that option is still available to you, of course, but with uh, Whirlwind in your arsenal, then you now have the option to not just force damage on Raikou, but force damage elsewhere on other Pokemon. And that lets you systematically break the opponent down. You know, and you know when uh, Snorlax is switching into Zap, it's like, oh, you Whirlwinded, and now you're 12.5% less healthy than you were, and now you're even more unable slash unwilling to switch into the move. And we have a replay from uh, the sample thread, actually. Uh, unfortunately, it also includes me, and I, yeah, I'm sorry to make this about myself, but it really isn't, I promise, um, yeah, so, yeah, and, uh, in that replay, I believe that the Zapdos does exactly what, you know, it's, it's supposed to with Whirlwind, so, the synergy is just so absurd here on all, it's firing on all cylinders, which you want a good team, you know, it's, everything is pointing in the same direction of just offense, 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 and, uh, I mean, uh, to, Another way that the Zapdos is made even more threatening with Whirlwinds and its Thunders is the fact that it is supported by three thieves. Thieves. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, Whirlwind, like, you see this a lot with stall teams spamming Roar Raikou. Like, yeah, they'll roar and get a bunch of spikes damage, but does it stick in the long term? Or it takes a while before it really starts being threatening, right? And when the opponent is lacking in leftovers, then... It's really scary. So that's why I, you know, I'm praising this team so much because, yes, in GSC, Snorlax is so... It's so overwhelming that it demands the highest level of respect. But if you can get around the traditional way of handling it, which is, you know, to slow it down because you can't out-offense it, then, yeah, that's, that's why this team is so bold and so excellent at what it is. This team has been, you know, very popularly spammed in all sorts of tournaments. And uh, successfully at that, and it's been you know copied, stolen, and you know inspired many other teams like the aforementioned Alakazam, because everything here is just very, very, very aggressive. <laughs> Even the defensive piece, the Snorlax, the necessary evil, quote unquote, is still a threat because it is a curse lax, a sleep talk curse lax at that. So, yeah, uh, I think that's. Basically the gist. Oh, um, alternate options. 
Yeah, so there's lots of things you can do here to make it even more aggressive. When I laddered with this, then I used to... I really enjoyed Hidden Power Water Gengar, because if Cloyster goes down and gets toxic or whatever, you really enjoy... You rely on spikes a lot, so you really, really like Gengar being able to Oko Golem. Uh, so, and that wound up serving me, you know, very, very well when I used this. And it also hits Tyranitar harder, so, but there's lots of options. You can go for Dynamic Punch, you can go for, you know, um, Destiny Bond, all sorts of things. But, you know, the standard Thief, Ice Punch, T-Bolt option, it's, uh, Thief, Ice Punch, T-Bolt, boom, I should say. It's great, you know, it's, this team, I mean, look, it, it, this is a high-maintenance team. It is not going to... Once you get past like, the cer a certain level of opponent, then it's not just going to hand you the wins itself, but no team is. And it gives you great options. For And for those of you who like playing the game you know, fast and emphasizing your own skill, then this is exactly the kind of team to do it. Not that you know slower teams can't do that too, the uh, skill emphasis, but for those who like uh, to overwhelm their opponents, that that's more their style, then this is it. Uh, yeah, I also enjoyed... What I like? Oh, uh, Thunder on Gengar is possible if you want to spread more Paralysis. Uh, I remember I tried Roar Nido King a few times just because I wanted to drag in Gengars so I could wear them down. So it was kind of my version of pursuit trapping them, you know, because I love using phasing moves like that. You know, dragging in Pokemon that don't want to be taking the damage. I've talked about it in a lot of videos recently, actually. I don't know why. Just because just it's such a cool strategy, you know? And, uh, yeah, so that was one thing I tried, but coverage is tough to drop. But there's all sorts of things you can throw in Lovely Kiss. Uh, you can, I like Nightmare on Jinx to really punish things like uh, Sleep Talk Snorlax, which has become... Like, not Curse Sleep Talk Snorlax, but Sleep Talk 2 Attack Snorlax, which has become a lot more popular. And I believe in the sample thread, it is cited as a reason for this team's, you know, lowered efficiency. Which, I suppose, but... It's nothing that a few moveset tweaks couldn't handle. Plus, you know, the fact that, you know, it's a Sleep Talk Curse Lax, which is specifically... Look, if Sleep Talk Curse Lax can handle, you know, EQ Curse Lax, I'm sure it can handle a non-boosting Snorlax. That's kind of how it works. But I, I understand the reservation. But yeah, you can try things like Nightmare Jinx. You can try Counter Jinx. That can be devastating. And yeah, uh, that's... Yeah, and uh, Zapdos can obviously run Leftovers, and you can... But I really like this set that, that is used. Um, yeah, I think Cloyster can even run Miracle Berry. If you really want to f run this team at a super fast pace and you can absorb a lovely kiss from Jinx or Snorlax with it, or um, or even Nidoking at full health, or a Sleep Powder from Exeggutor, you know, you don't get ruined by a Snorlax Body Slam para, you know. So that's a cool option I like. But yeah, it's very flexible. And uh, now we will go for the replay. And I'm sorry it stars me, but it was in the thread. So yeah. Uh, so, actually give me a second because I need to take a bathroom break. All right. Yeah, I thought I could stick it out for the replay, but you know, don't test your bl uh, bladder. It's listen to your body, stay healthy, and of course, drink a lot of water. 
I always do. Anyway, so uh, as you can see, I'm leading with Nido King here. So uh, that's another thing you can do, <laughs> obviously. Uh, yeah, I wonder if I was going with double sleep. I guess I was. Yeah, with the amount of sleep talk flying around, then you can definitely get away with double lovely kiss. I forget why, because this is a replay from, you know, almost from like three and a half years ago. But it's, um, it, the flexibility it gives you and the opportunities it opens up, you know, and that you're able to immediately threaten Snorlax like this, for example, you know, with uh, risking less than you would with Jinx in this scenario, because of Nidoking's greater bulk, then that's big. Anyway, you immediately get the Thief, and it's, look, it's either going to be Lax or it's going to be Zapdos, and either way, it's great, and then you have two more backing it up. So, uh, Hidden Power, Thief, oh, there's a nice crit, good job, Kev, you really earned that one. Uh, <laughs> now Jinx, in, Jinx is in, oh uh, yeah, just trying to force the Zapdos into an uncomfortable position, and now Raikou comes in, Raikou is thieved, so you already have two really big Pokemon thieved, and you want to thief Snorlax, obviously, but that's the thing about having so much thief pressure and having Whirlwind on Zapdos, that the whole systematic breakdown of the opposing team, the way it works is that even if you don't nail one specific target, by taking out the other Pokemon on the team, then, or weakening them, then you open up opportunities so that you can then zero in and isolate, you know, the threat. And what I mean by this in practical terms is, like, let's say you don't thief the Snorlax, okay, but you're going to wear down the Zapdos, you're going to wear down the Raikou, you're going to wear down whatever else they have. And then by doing that, then you are able to get a more concentrated um, assault on the Snorlax. And, you know, because if you're just desperate to beat Snorlax and you're going to try anything, and they have a healthy team, then they're never going to let you, they're never going to give you that opportunity to take down the Snorlax. But when you have the rest of their team beaten down, then you are much more able to concentrate all your efforts on the Lax. So, hopefully uh, that makes sense. If not, leave a comment. Leave a comment anyway. I like reading them. Uh, there's Cloyster coming in to take a big Psychic uh, and not switch into my Lax now, so that's great. And now here comes Raikou. Nice Ice Beam on the switch against the Cloyster. Oh my god, amazing. Anyway, so uh, this reminds me that I may have uh, overlooked a major, major strategy that this team employs to great effect. So another one of those hyper-offensive strategies. It's, again, it's not all one, but from the Spikes plus Thief Spam plus Whirlwind Zapdos, like, that's all great. But this team also has three moves that can freeze. Jinx and Nidoking run Ice Beam and Gengar right, runs Ice Punch. And, generally, spamming these moves is very safe and very riskless. And, uh, all you need is one freeze to really swing the game in your favor. So, it's not a team that entirely relies on freeze, but when you are spamming ice moves so much, you know, it's not just 10%. On one turn, yes, it is 10%, but if you're spamming it over and over and over and over and over again, and hitting Pokemon that aren't ice types, like obviously you couldn't freeze the Cloyster there because it's half ice, but you know, the more you spam ice moves into non-ice types, and you just need the one freeze and then for them not to thaw out, obviously, but the defrost rate in GSC is remarkably low. It's 10%, as opposed to 20 in later gens. So, yeah, you... Obviously, you know, in this specific game, I got lucky. You know, the second of the two... Um, the second of the two ice beams freezing. But uh, also, like, with the, with the way this team hits so hard... Like, look, it's not just a, a freeze. It's like, if either of those ice beams crits... If either of them freezes, you. this is a, a good example of how aggressive offensive teams like l put odds in their favor. I mean, obviously you want to do the direct route of I'm going to stack Spice, I'm going to wear them down with good switches and whirlwinds and thief and whatnot. But when you also stack these odds in your favor, where just one crit can be backbreaking and you're attacking over and over and over, you know, giving yourself as many opportunities to attack as possible. I mean, okay, I'm not saying I haven't gotten lucky in this game in particular, but it's just an example. You know, so Nido King, Thie okay, the Thief crit too, but that one doesn't really matter. But, you know, Nido King's Ice Beaming, and then, you know, Jinx is Ice Beaming and Psychicking and Ice Beaming and Ice Beaming. So you want to just be attacking s uh, a lot, and with a team hitting this fast and aggressive, then, you know, just one can be devastating. I mean, also, it is GSC, so one might not necessarily be enough, you know, if against a good opponent with a good team. Uh, but, you know, that's where the nuances of each individual game and the two players involved in it come into play. So, uh, yeah, Raikou gets frozen at 23. 
and no lefties. <laughs> yeah, I mean, lo just look at that highlight. You know, 23% frozen, no lefties. <laughs> anyway, so now uh, Snorlax comes in, Cloyster's gonna spike. Cool. And now Gengar comes in to avoid a boom and eats a surf, but do I go for Thief? I hope I do. No, I just go for Ice Punch like a coward. Uh, I guess I was tr I was looking for the Zapdos, yeah. And uh, now he makes a nice pivot on the Zapdos to Thief. Nice move from Serpy. But, okay, now I'm on the defensive because, yes, even this hyper-offensive GSC team, as in a lot of other generations, but even this hyper-offensive GSC team, uh, and actually this is extremely true for Advance in particular, but, you know, I'm not going to be able to generate enough offense no matter what Pokemon I use. No, and even if I brought, you know, the most screaming offensive Pokemon in the game, you know, I would still not be able to just overwhelm everything with such sheer force. I don't think there's any generation like that, you know, outside of maybe a couple of gens of Ubers, where I wouldn't be able to generate such offensive prowess that I just never, ever go on the defensive. If, you know, you could do that consistently with a team, that team or the Pokemon on it might be broken. <laughs> so you are going to have to fall back on the defensive at some point. That's just a natural part of Pokemon. So even, I mean, even like Gen 4 hyper offense teams, they have some level of defensive synergy to them. And it's not about switching into opposing Pokemon uh, to counter them safely, but about taking advantage of your Pokemon's weaknesses. You know, like if they Earthquake your Tyranitar, close combat your Tyranitar, then your Gyarados will set up, for example. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, but here in, in GSC, it's still not quite there. But, uh, yeah, here we have uh, Snorlax coming in to take the Zapdos, because it's Sleep Talk. And, okay, Skarmory... Wow! Good switch, Kev. <laughs> so I, sc I scares out the Zapdos, and in comes uh, my Whirlwind Zapdos. And in comes Golem as... Oh, wow. Okay, great move. Yeah, so I guess I read that the Golem was there, and I go for Hidden Power. Yeah, because if Snorlax comes in, then I Whirlwind it, and if Golem tries to pivot on a Thunder, which is, you know, very obvious, because this last slot... You know, with Skarmory, then the last slot needs to be a Firelax answer. So it's either going to be a Ghost, which is not coming in, uh, but if there is a Golem, it's a very high chance it comes in and tries to pivot off the Thunder so that Snorlax, with two turns of sleep, and slept by Nidoking's um, Lovely Kiss, meaning it does not control its own sleep. It doesn't know when it's going to wake up. So it doesn't want to switch into a Thunder on the Switch, and, you know, unbeknownst to him, I'm Magnet Thunder at that. So he's going to try and pivot with Golem, maybe even get a spin off. If it gets it on the Thunder, I'm going to get a spin, and then, you know, see where it goes from there. But, uh... Just HP water. So yeah, aggressive. Uh, this is the kind of team that rewards that kind of aggressive play. Um, another fun fact about GSC, as you see, if you were paying attention to the screen right now, and if not, then don't worry. But uh, I will hover over to the battle log. Raikou was hurt by the spikes. Raikou thought out. Raikou switched in after Golem was fainted by HP uh, water. It was the end. The turn was over. But yes, you can thaw out just by switching in. Uh, this you'll see this in tournament games sometimes, where a po where a trainer a trainer what am I a BGC commentator uh, the Pokemon Stadium commentator now that guy's cool um, <laughs> he was the announcer of the show too I think anyway very comforting voice but the uh, idea being in a big tournament game you will often see that he will he will um, the player will sorry I got distracted. Uh, <laughs> Is that a text I need to respond to? No, it's just some stupid nonsense. Um, so I'm just going to write back after, you know, how dare you bother me with this. Because <laughs> I'm very important. Anyway, uh, don't you know who I am? So, to get to the point, finally, uh, you will see tournament players switching in frozen Pokemon. In later generations, uh, then it's you switch in a frozen Pokemon and you take a turn, like you try to use U-turn or whatever move you have with whatever frozen Pokemon, because you have to uh, make a move, you know, an active move, use uh, use one of your four moves to uh, thaw out, right? But no, in uh, GSC, you can just switch in and you might thaw. So that's the one benefit of counter, of uh, fighting against Freeze in Gen 2, that you can, if you just switch your uh, there was an SPL game recently where this was attempted over the course of several hundred turns. <laughs> and it took a while because 10% is still not that much. But yeah, Raikou's forced to rest and like now Cloyster's... Get this is what I mean by systematic. You know, because otherwise, uh, if you just had a standard Rest Talk Zapdos and you had a, a matchup against Raikou and Skarmory, right? 
but it, you're and you're gonna double switch and try to wear down the Raikou. But in no scenario where you're double switching between Zapdos and Snorlax, in no scenario are you forcing damage on the Cloister. So it's literally just between Raikou and Skarmory. And when you're forcing damage elsewhere, it is so much easier to break through the team. I know I've made this point before, but I wanted to illustrate it with this example. So. Yeah, Cloyster switches out now, and I just go for a T-Bolt because I'm a coward, slash there's no read, uh, need to risk it. I get a crit T-Bolt, nastily, and does that, the Raikou not, I mean, here we see Thief at work. We haven't even gotten the third Thief off, uh, but just, I mean, all you need is two, god. All you need is one sometimes. Okay, so Snorlax has a free switch in, and uh, Skarmory is going to not come in because he's afraid. I think he switched to Snorlax there because he was uh, thought I was going to double the Zapdos, but there's no risk at this point because I'm very far ahead. And, um... Now Skarm comes in, because who cares, and I rest, and Cloyster comes in, and I'm still not letting it in for free because of Sleep Talking Double Edge, so, see, like, even that, like, yes, it's a sleeping Snorlax, but it's also a Sleep Talking Snorlax, so you can't exactly abuse it too easily, uh, so, and it's like, oh, well, what about Golem? Golem abuses, uh, well, that's why you have a Whirlwind HP Water Zapdos, you know, you drag the Golem in, you either KO it as it stays in unsurprised, it shouldn't be surprised by HP Water at this point, but... Uh, it's... Or you just whirlwind it in and you chase it out just like you would Skarmory or something. You know? Actually, I think Jimothy Cool used this when we had our Best of Five exhibition. That's why it was fresh in my memory. Anyway, so now at this point, I'm, you know, very, very far ahead. And there's no reason, real reason to risk it, so I just stay in just to burn a turn because what's Skarmory gonna do? Oh, I curse. Now I go to Zapdos. And... Yeah. So... Snorlax is down, Zapdos isn't switching in, Raikou is, you know, in big trouble. Even if it didn't get crit, it was in big trouble, obviously. And, you know, I just go for t bolt and, you know... Yeah, so, I mean, the forfeit, but here you see a hyper-offense team um, in GSC facing... And I'm sorry to make an example out of Serpy, I promise I... Not, Serpy is an amazing RBY player, just in case anyone has any uh, doubts about his ability. He's been putting on a clinic in SPL. Anyway, so the point is, for example's sake, this is not an uncommon thing to see this kind of team beat, you know, a very solid double electric stall team, you know, one of the most solid styles in GSC, in under 30 turns. You know, yeah, okay, you know, if the game played out, then it would have been a little over 30. But effectively, the game was the game was over before this, before turn 28, you know? The, there was no, unless I, you know, had serious... Unless I started watching a movie, you know, in the middle of the game and forgot that I was playing. Uh, so, yeah. Alright, uh, I think that is basically it. I have already heaped all the praise and the detail that I wanted to on this, I think. But yeah, uh, congrats to Kaste for for changing the GSC metagame with this. And as we, we see its uh, influence uh, still, we still see it used sometimes, as we should because it's very good. But yeah, I mean, you look at the uh, the other sample teams in GSC, and a lot of them are very, very either scared of it or uh, influenced by it. But yeah, just like uh, this Alakazam team, because, you know, you see these fast, frail special attackers, these Jinxes and Gengars and Nidoking kind of counts. Well, you can chuck a, a Zapdos in there. Does this Eggy have Thief? It should. No, it doesn't. Okay, well, this team would be really benefited by Thief. Anyway, point being... Uh, yeah, I think the point has been made. So, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed greatly, and I will see you in the next one.